comment. I would uh, very much love to see that point being raised when our minister comes in a short while. The fact that the question is not so much about making technologies as available as it is about assisting in of reforming so that the right policies are there and then technologies will flow by themselves. How interested would you say that, uh, Mafalda, that uh, the developing countries are in these issues? I mean, there are many. I mean, have you seen a big interest or...? or I can just tell you that there is a big interest. Uh, African countries understand the relevance of diversi diversifying the energy mix because as he was saying, they are highly exposed to volatility of uh, oil prices. Uh, and most of, and uh, many of them are big importers. Um, uh, and so what you see is that many, several, many, many countries have strategies in place which state diversifying the energy mix by 2020, by 2030. But obviously they need support to attain those goals. So if you think about Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Morocco, Egypt, all of these countries, South Africa, have policies, have strategies. They have strategies in place to meet a certain target in terms of diversifying the energy mix by bringing in either wind investments or solar uh, or hydro power. So the it is on the, the agenda. It yeah. is very much on the agenda. Arild, go ahead. Yeah. Is it working? Good. Um, you were a mix of John Lennon and, and Lenin. Because, uh, <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> John Lennon was saying power to the people right now, and Lenin said that socialism is planning and ele electricity, and you said maybe development is planning and electricity. Now, one thing, I mean, how important is electricity in the overall development? It's, it's one question I would maybe like to reflect on. But second, what you didn't mention is that in a lot of countries, there's huge subsidies for carbon. For, for fossil fuel consumption, and you can provide technologies, but you also have to change the basic, the pricing of this. And, and you did mention that, but I'm sure you, you have some thoughts that would be interesting to hear on this continued subsidies for fossil fuels, where it should be the opposite. Yannick? Oh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's clear that climate change will oblige us to rehabilitate long-term integrated planning. Whether it's Lenin or not, it's, <laughs> we still have to go back to long-term integrated planning. The idea that market forces left to themselves will resolve every single problem, I don't think you really have to be a diet hard to believe that. The, uh, often when you want to change the energy mix, it takes 50 years and you have to plan for it. Now, how do we finance the incremental cost? There are different options. I took the least uh, controversial one the uh, tariff increase and the uh, carbon markets. But yes, one possibility is uh, reforming the energy subsidies. The energy subdi subsidies right now for fossil fuel are anywhere between 500 billion, billion. to 1 trillion. Mm. We, don't, we actually yes. at a few hundred billion dollars close, we don't know. Mm. And so if we could, uh, if we could recycle uh, there's energy subsidies, we will have enough money to actually uh, uh, cover the incremental cost of renewable energy for the near term uh, compared to uh, fossil, fuel activity, uh, fossil fuel energies. Now, there are plenty of other innovative sources of finance uh, when it comes to, to that. You have, for example, also curbing illegal uh, financial flow. You have 21 uh, trillion dollars right now illegally uh, in some accounts. Uh, if, uh, if, they were, if it could be taxed as they, as they will be normally tax, 3% on 21 trillion, you end up with 630 billion. If you tax at 25, you end up with 200 billion dollars. That is Lenin, but you have 200 billion dollars to, uh, <laughs> to uh, finance uh, renewable energy. So there are mechanisms. If you have the political will, there are mechanisms to do it, and especially if you have done your utmost to ensure that you can do it in a cost-effective manner before. I mean, having said that, let me say that some countries are already heading in that direction. And, and let us not forget that there are subsidies both on developed and developing countries. And some developing countries in Africa are already heading in that direction. Uh, you must have realized that some months back uh, in Nigeria, government tried to reform uh, subsidies and there was some upfield so social up, uh, yeah. riots. Uh, so these are sensitive agendas and they require considering a lot of considerations that are outside of the energy sector per se. This is one point that I also made uh, during my presentation. Plus you cannot reform subsidies alone. 
Yes. The, because why, nobody wants to give subsidies. I mean, policymakers are not dumb. They don't like to give subsidies. But often they feel that they are obliged, either for, for social reasons or competitiveness reasons. Because if they don't give tax, uh, sub, uh, tax uh, breaks, for example, uh, the, uh, the business will go to another place. So it has to be part of a global effort to reform yeah. subsidies. What would you say you say today about 10% of Africa is electrified? In rural uh, areas. In rural areas. Africa yes. is now, the economy is growing very quick. In what kind of hurry are we? I mean, how fast will the need be for more energy? I had a slide energy? there on infrastructure de gap, deficit, that combined basically transport and energy. And I, I don't recall exactly the numbers, but it's something in the order of 25 to 50 billion dollars a year that is required to close the gap. So we need that, uh, uh, we need everything to be in place quite soon with those ideas of uh, the green market transformation and so to meet those needs and challenges. But the reason in why everybody way. speak about scaling up is because the window of opportunity is uh, shrinking extremely fast. And the, uh, 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 the nightmare scenario is that we don't get enough money early enough to basically shift toward uh, uh, a green uh, energy uh, paradigm. And we end up needing a lot, a lot of money for disaster relief. And uh, the uh, time is definitely the essence. We need uh, much more money and we need it fast with instruments that can scale up effort. So it's and Africa is a good investment because you know, we don't have the issue of developed countries, which is a lot of retrofitting has to take place. Africa, they are making greenfield investments. So we do not want to lock in capital. A short last. Based on our, our first poll we took, Yannick, there's a lot of academics in the room. So all the teachers, when they saw that slide, which showed the dramatic increase in cost all in financing, that's really powerful for the classroom. So I'm stealing it. My question is from Mafalda. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot today <laughs> about uh, you know, sort of the pro and you're a specialist on, on development and environment in Africa. One issue that hasn't come up is the role of China. Yes. And it strikes me, we just did a recent study at Aid Data that found that the two largest sectors that China is giving in, both the government, official flows, and private finance, are uh, energy, infrastructure and energy. And, yeah. and so we're talking about this huge capital problem. Uh, what role is China likely to play here? Can they help close this capital gap? But are they lending in areas that aren't going to be conducive to uh, sort of they, sustainable they, development? It's a mix. It's a mix. Uh, so China uh, is investing, for example, on, or will be investing in hydropower in Ethiopia. It will also be investing in railway um, in some countries. Uh, in other countries, is investing in less environmentally friendly or making uh, less environmentally friendly investments. Uh, but they are, do, they are bringing capital flows to Africa, and significant ones. Thank it's you very much, Mafalda, Yannick. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.